Hello my dear friends, in this video I would like to share my point of view on how to prevent endothelial damage during the process of phacoemulsification. And to do this we should actually know what are the causes that produce endothelial damage during phaco and the three main culprits that fit into this group are firstly the effect of ultrasonic energy, second is the release of toxic hydroxyl ions during phaco emulsification and the erosive effect of sharp nucleus fragments carried by the aspiration flow rate. By and large, ultrasound waves are extremely safe to the eyes and they are used in diagnostic purposes for A scan, B scan, M scans and Doppler scans in the range of 2 to 18 megahertz. However, they can have harmful effects. Now these are the thermal and the cavitational effects which can be used in phaco as well as a vibratory effect which is used in lithotripsy. Now the thermal energy can cause a heating up of the surrounding tissues. Now this heat gets quickly dissipated by the aspiration flow rate and it is unlikely to damage the endothelium even if phaco is done very close to it. Only if the tissue is in direct contact with the phaco tip, thermal effects become evident as in the case of wound burn. Now ultrasound produces cavitational energy by a phenomenon called ebullism in which small bubbles generated by the increased negative pressure implode releasing tremendous amount of energy. Now this could be to the tune of 600 atmospheres of pressure and reaching temperatures of more than 5000 Kelvin. The cavitation effects are actually used to burst adipocytes in liposuction procedure. It was thought at one time that this is the most significant cause of nucleus emulsification during phaco emulsification. However, Dr. James Zacharias in 2008 conducted studies under high pressure conditions and he clearly showed that cavitation has no role in nucleus phaco emulsification. He also showed that the primary mechanism was a mechanical one called the jackhammer effect. This essentially means that even if phaco is activated in the anterior chamber, the two tissue damaging effects of ultrasound namely thermal and cavitational will not damage the endothelium. So the jackhammer effect also will not damage the endothelium unless the phaco tip touches the endothelium directly by mistake. The other effect of ultrasonic energy is vibratory and is used in lithotripsy where piezoelectric ceramics generate 23 to 25,000 hertz now which is transmitted by a hollow probe and placed against the renal calculi. This will make the calculi vibrate at its resonant frequency which matches the frequency of the ultrasound generated which will result in breaking it up. This effect is not used in phaco. In fact, an interesting paper presented by Dr. Tarun Dewan in which he suggests that the phaco probe be created at a frequency that matches the resonant frequency of the nucleus. However, the only significant energy that participates in phaco is not ultrasonic but it's actually mechanical and this is called the jackhammer effect. The culprit number two is the ultrasound effect of phaco causes the release of harmful free radicals in the form of hydroxyl ions. Now this process is called sonolysis where water is actually broken up to release hydroxyl ions and hydrogen ions. Hydroxyl ions are extremely toxic to the endothelium. In an article published in 2016 in Scientific Reports by Sutomo Igarashi et al., they implicate hydroxyl ions in endothelial damage and the amount of these ions generated is linearly related to the phaco time. So how do we prevent this or how do we counteract this? So hydrogen infused into the irrigating solutions can counteract the hydroxyl ions. However, there are currently no commercial solutions that contain diffuse hydrogen. Balance all solution and balance all solution plus are ionic solutions and can scavenge the free radicals better than the Hartmann Ringer lactate. Frequent use of OBD, especially dispersive, is important not only to coat the endothelium but also to prevent damage. And finally, the most important risk factor to endothelial damage in a multivariate linear regression analysis by Dr. Hayashi who looked at several factors like the amount of fluid, the hardness of cataract, the phaco duration etc. And he found that it was the nucleus fragment that eventually caused damage to the endothelium. 
To sum up, use copious amounts of OVDs, use BSS or BSS plus and not ringer lactate. Develop efficiency in techniques so you can minimize the phaco time. Most importantly, it does not matter whether you trench or you chop to create the fragments. How you end up managing these fragments will determine whether you end up with a clear cornea or not. Let's look at some case examples here. Let's observe this particular case, the management of a grade 3 nuclear sclerotic cataract. And I've come to the stage of fragment removal. I've already cracked the pieces. Now you can see that while I'm attempting to remove one fragment, there are already smaller pieces that are floating around in the anterior chamber. Note that the piece that I am mobilizing into the anterior chamber is quite large. And as I tend to downsize it, it causes the release of multiple small fragments. Now it is these fragments which are carried by the aspiration flow rate and they circulate in the anterior chamber, hit and knock against the corneal endothelium and can produce mechanical damage. So one needs to be very careful when they mobilize the nuclear fragments, do not mobilize large pieces of nucleus because this will definitely break down into a smaller shrapnel which has a potential to damage the endothelium. And if you see any shrapnel in the anterior chamber, address it first before you mobilize the next piece. This is what I'm not doing in this case. I'm not addressing that shrapnel, going to the underlying piece and this fragment is free to roam around and hit against the endothelium. Let's look at another case where I am performing the fragment removal. This is also a grade 3 to 4 nucleus sclerotic cataract. As you mobilize the piece and as you downsize it, I am not paying too much attention to the small fragments that are circulating in the anterior chamber. In fact, I am totally ignoring that small piece there and I am attacking the next fragment without completely removing all the pieces that got released from the first nucleus fragment. The only thing that we need to worry about is the mechanical damage induced by the fragments onto the endothelium. So to minimize fragment induced endothelial damage, I suggest the following technique. I call it the OSPOT technique, which is nothing but an anagram for one single piece at a time. Now let's see how this technique will help you to reduce fragment induced damage to the corneal endothelium. Now at the outset, do not aim for a large rexus. Keep it around 5 to 5.25 millimeters, even if you have quite hard cataract. Like in this case, it is a grade 3 nucleus sclerotic cataract. Of course, ensure good hydro dissection. Now then start to create the fragments. Now while creating the fragments, you can use trenching or you can use chopping. It doesn't really make a difference according to the scientific evidence that exists. Now my standard technique of course is the direct chop technique and let us see how I am able to control fragment induced damage to the corneal endothelium. So after burying the phaco tip into the heart of the nucleus, I initiate and create a crack. Make sure that the crack goes through and through, try to separate the posterior plate and then create a small fragment. While you're making the chop, make sure that you create multiple small fragments and do not go for just creating four fragments. Well, the logic is when you mobilize a small fragment, you have more control of the number of small pieces it's going to break up into. And you can see how clean the anterior chamber is when I emulsify this fragment. You also see that I do not move to the next fragment till I have completely finished with this fragment, including the main section of the fragment as well as the small subsidiary fragments that get released while downsizing it. You have to address it at one go. Keep the anterior chamber clean from smaller fragments that circulate in it. Again create another small piece. 
Now even though this modification is probably going to enlarge your fake or time, you will definitely get rewarded with crystal clear corneas on first post-operative day. Be in the center, emulsify at the level of the iris plane, create small fragments, let the rest of the nucleus remain within the capsular bag and this is the reason why I suggest that we keep the rexus size only around 5.25 millimeters because if you create a large capsular rexus, the vacuum and the aspiration flow rate will dispel all the fragments, more than one nucleus fragments will come into the anterior chamber. So the presence of a small capsular rexus helps to keep the nucleus mass inside the capsular bag and well away from the corneal endothelium. Now during the entire procedure you see that the small fragments that are created are emulsified, they are completely removed before I address the next fragment. And while the second fragment is tending to come up, my second instrument pushes it back into the capsular bag. And only after I finish with the previous fragment, I address this particular fragment and this concludes the entire management of the nucleus. This was how the patient's cornea looked on the first post-operative day. Crystal clear corneas just by a simple modification of technique. Let's take a look at another example. This is a much harder cataract. So I'm going with the capsular axis. Of course, the standard teaching is if you have a grade 4 nucleus sclerotic cataract, go for a larger size rexis because it will help you to mobilize the fragments. But I would uh, recommend that you keep your rexis size to your usual 5 millimeters or 5.25 millimeters because you're not going to mobilize large fragments. The mobilization of large nuclear fragments will cause multiple small nuclear fragments to form while you're downsizing it and this can definitely be deleterious. Now in the previous example you saw that I actually created the fragments before I mobilized them. Now I'm filling the anterior chamber with viscote to protect the endothelium. In this case I'm going to use a slightly different approach in that I would mobilize the fragments one at a time one single piece at a time. Well, that's the mantra you have to follow if you want to get clear corneas. So make sure that the crack goes through and through. Create a small fragment. And again, make sure that this fragment is sufficiently freed from the surrounding nucleus. Now, mobilize this fragment alone and downsize it quickly. Address all the breakaway portions of fragments that get released at one go. Do not go to create another fragment till you have completely cleared the anterior chamber of all fragments. Now the anterior chamber is clean. Now I go down and take another fragment. The important thing is to use a sufficiently high aspiration flow rate because it will help to increase the followability of the pieces. Trying to play it safe by keeping a low aspiration flow rate is fine but it will reduce the followability of the pieces. So it is important that you use an aspiration flow rate and use power settings appropriate to the grade of nucleus sclerosis. In a hard cataract, you cannot set a low power and low aspiration flow rate. This is going to prolong your phaco time and you know that when the phaco time is prolonged, it leads to a lot of unnecessary complications and endothelial damage. A little amount of viscote is added again and I go back to the process of breaking down this nucleus into a small fragment. It actually makes a lot of sense that you address one small fragment at a time. So even though while downsizing, small pieces of fragment get released, I make sure that I clean up 
these pieces, I address these pieces before I go to the next fragment. The nucleus is remaining within the capsular bag. It's not slipped out of the capsular bag. The anterior chamber is extremely clear of nucleus fragments. Now if you have this kind of surgery, you can be sure that the nuclear fragments knocking against the endothelium is minimized. You see that particular fragment because of the use of viscote which is very sticky, it tends to stick to the endothelium so I had to address that. And then I come to the last and final piece and this is also addressed in a similar fashion. This is just a minor modification of the technique which most of us already use. The slightly increased duration of the surgery is a small price to pay for getting crystal clear corneas on the first post-operative day. So remember one small piece at a time. Post-operatively, you get rewarded with a crystal clear cornea. I hope this lecture has been useful. I thank you for your attention.